So that is going to be my level three value that I'm going to be concerned about. Sponge. I've got like a sponge holding this piece to keep it from falling off. All right. So get rid of this. Paint's gray. I usually leave a fair amount of sort of junk from previous mixes on my palette uh, because I like having that to decrease the saturation. Most color you see in nature is not very strongly saturated. It's very rare you'll get an extremely saturated color. So I like having other mixes that I can sort of knock down the color a little bit. The first thing I like to do is pre-wet the, pretty much the whole thing. I'm gonna um, jump around a little bit when I'm doing the sky because I wanna leave some kind of arbitrary light spots for um, cloud light. But for the most part, I'm just gonna carry this water down. And what I'm shooting for here is I'm gonna go for a very light value at first. And my main goal is just to knock everything away from white. So I wanna get rid of white. A lot of times, um, you know, and everybody kind of develops their own sort of method and practice for getting uh, color down on a scene. But a lot of times I have found when I don't get rid of white pretty much from the get-go or if I try to sort of window shade as a tech term which is to say like paint area by area I find I end up with little white kind of spots speckled everywhere. So I'm gonna try to basically get rid of the white as much as possible and I'm gonna get in a nice strong blue here and this I'm using a lot of water so it doesn't really matter too much what the colors are that I'm using I mean it's good to have some things like because the things that are a specific color that I need the local color to be close to correct I want to keep you know but the sky and uh, uh, you know these things can melt down into each other and it's not going to be a big deal yet so I don't have to worry about um, being too careful or cautious yet because everything else is gonna be a slightly darker value, which will sit on top of all of this. To do the sky, I'm gonna get uh, blue with cobalt blue, maybe a little bit of red to knock it down some. And then I'm gonna get a warm going for typically on the zenith of the sky. And this is something that I, I've just have picked up from painting on location. You know, you lose a lot of this kind of information when you're painting from a photograph because it tends to crunch that value and you lose that color character. But skies tend to get warmer as you go down um, if you're going closer to the sunlight. So we're moving towards the sunlight. So I'm going to probably have some warms down in this area. Um, if you're looking the other way, you can tend to get more cerulean kind of colors, more. Uh, And you can even get greens. The sky is um, a really fascinating thing to focus on because you, you really get the full gamut of color in the sky. So I'm going to be fairly uh, arbitrary here and just try to avoid some whites as I go. And I pre-wet it <clears throat> because my hope is to have my hope is that I will have soft edges in the end. And it doesn't matter if I end up having areas that are not quite as soft as I want them to be because I can always come back and, um, and use clean water to sort of loosen it up. But here I'm gonna come in with my warm and start to work my way underneath. You also get um, on clouds, they'll typically get particularly lower clouds, they'll, will, they'll pick up some light as well. Let bounce light, so light that hits the ground and bounces back up into the bottom of the cloud. You'll get some warms in those as well. So I wanna be aware of that as well when I'm putting it in. Jared, for those people who can't uh, open the PDF right now, could you show your uh, reference photo uh, every so often or just? Yeah, let's see. 
I can hold it like that for now. Okay, thank you. And maybe I can, uh, if I hadn't taped this down, I don't, I don't think it'll sit now long. That's okay, just, you know, just so they can have a, um, every sure. once in a while where you're going. So I'm dragging in some of my previous mixes here just to get this sort of muddy uh, gray. I want to keep some of this stuff warm. But a lot of what I'm putting down now is going to um, dry much, much lighter than it's going down. So it's, I'm, not too, I'm not too worried about whether or not it's, it's just laser accurate and perfect. Uh, I, tend, I tend to have a gray mixed with other colors. Uh, my go-to for that is ultramarine and burnt sienna. Get some of this warm. The flag is fairly, I have this nice, I'd like to pick up that uh, kind of sky blue. I've got um, cobalt blue that I'm using for my cools and I also like this uh, horizon blue from Holbein. So I'm going to pick up some of those greens in the lower areas and a lot of that yellow ochre to try to give the sense in the underpainting at least that light is kind of bouncing off the ground and shooting up into the lower facing planes of this uh, these buildings. I'm going to paint around this. And this area I know is going to be pretty warm. I go back to my gray here. Yeah, you can see it's like fat on the base and then goes to a really sharp. We're, we're really kind of catching a reflection, Jared, on the left hand side where that uh, those dormers are on your painting. If you could lift your your big whiteboard up a little bit on the right side, like just tilt it up just to give us a view of what you're painting toward toward the right yeah like that there you go tilt it the other way yeah that's it that's it okay just once in a while so we could see sure yeah that's probably yeah. gonna go away too i mean as it, as it dries yeah that's better right there whatever you did got this uh blue mailbox there. And this is my lighter value, so I'm just gonna carry it. I want it to be fairly warm and then maybe some areas being cool on top, but a lot of this is gonna be sort of a light kind of value. Okay, so that's it for the, uh, the first kind of wash down. So what I might do now is I'm wondering if I can temporarily mute you all so I don't blow out your speakers with the hair dryer for just a second. That should be good. Typically I'll try to sort of play in the, I usually go without using the hair dryer 
because I, I do like the idea of having some of these areas dissolve into other areas. So ideally like the trees that are gonna go over here, I would like to have them sort of dissolve back into the space. Um, but since we're doing the, uh, the demo, I don't want to uh, have it, to, I'd, I'd like to get it closer to, uh, you know. So I'm gonna do a kind of cool blue for these distant trees. I'm gonna to try to get rid of a lot of the water and I'm gonna use the side of my brush to sort of rake in this texture. And I'm using uh, cobalt blue and yellow ochre Can put in that just to set that area off. Then I'll have something to work on, work, work with as I work into my other trees. But I'd like these trees to go further back into space. And now I can get right into our medium value. Now I'm going to move into my level two value. So I've got, you know, starting on that roof, if I want to start there, you can start anywhere. Um, and I'm just going to work my way down, reloading often, and then changing the color as I go. I'm also going to get a hat because my hair is going to my face. All right, so I want to try to pick up a little bit of this blue that's happening on the dome on the top of the cylinder because I really like this, um, it's like a very reflective kind of uh, material and, and it's picking up a lot of that sky fill light. So essentially as I work my way down, I'm trying to remember that I have two main light sources here. I have the sky, we're going ultramarine burnt sienna, that was cobalt blue. I'm coming right into that with ultramarine burnt sienna. I just want to have a little, just a little touch of pale blue on that back side where that, um, you know, it's even a little green. I might even try to see if I can't. And I'm just going for the shape here. I'm gonna tip it with this uh, teal. I've got a little bit of cobalt teal. I just thought, I want to really push this uh, color here. I really like that color. And I'm starting to let the water run off, run out, and scrape in a little bit of that texture because I don't want to sit here. You know, I find in sketches where you get really specific and architectural, which there's nothing wrong with that for people who really enjoy doing that, but I find it tends to look a little bit more like a, like a real estate advertisement than a, let's get our cross. They're really really beautifully shaped. Don't want to stray too far from the design, but I like the dark on light that that gives us. Um, and now I'm going to work into some warm here, some raw sienna and gray. And I've got this little piece that sort of pokes out and then we're going to work our way down. And I'm trying to be conscious of the fact that we've got our two light sources, our two main light sources. We have just the touch picking up here and then this thing makes a cast shadow. So again, we've got our warm, hot light from the sky. These little arches are really beautiful, I don't wanna miss. And then we've got a, a fill light and that's gonna be the, the atmosphere, the blue of the sky over here. So we've got blue over here and hot, warm, well that turned out green. <laughs> uh, there we go. Hot yellow over here. And so that yellow light, warm light, so to speak, sorry, is gonna be hitting our objects full force, but it's also gonna be hitting the objects and bouncing off the objects, which is something you can really focus on studying in still lifes. I do a lot of still lifes um, I never liked doing still lifes as I was developing painting. I always thought it was kind of a stuffy sort of something that was seemed uh, too, too high art for me <laughs> as a, you know, a cartoonist. I felt like it might be something that maybe I wouldn't understand if I tried. But then 
I came to really fall in love with still lifes because you really take the sort of the microcosm. You can create a microcosm of the, uh, you know, the infinite expanse of color that's happening where light is bouncing off of objects. So if you have like a bunch of colors in a sketch, we're going to pitch burnt sienna now to get this sort of that beautiful uh, tile roof. But I love with still lifes, you can really get the, um, I'm trying to be conscious by the way of the amount of water that I'm using because if I use too much water, it's gonna, it's gonna dry like a one. So I'm trying to be sure to be, be pretty decisive here and in, in the strength of the value that I'm putting down. And I don't care that these are going to melt into each other because if I close an eye and squint again, I lose a lot of this information. So if I'm closing an eye and squinting and losing the information, then it's not as important. So I'm going to just let that sort of dissolve. But I'm trying to be aware of the fact that I've got light bouncing up into objects. So we're going to have warms in this area. We're going to have warmer colors as we get lower because it's hitting the ground is gonna pick up some concrete, bounce that up into the lower areas, and it's also gonna pick up these greens. So we're gonna get various sort of shades of green in the lower facing planes. One of the best uh, bit, bits of advice that I've got was um, from a friend of mine, James Gurney, who described um, trying to think of, trying to think, if you're trying to think of the color of an area that you're putting in, try to think of yourself, picture yourself as a little ant like walking across an area. And if you look directly up, that's the, that's the area that's gonna influence the color of what you're putting down. So if you look up and you see the sky, well then you're gonna to wanna to focus on cooler colors. And if you look up, you know, if we're an ant, we get under here, for example, we take a break from the, up there and talk about this. But if you're a little ant and you walk into this, under here on the porch and look straight up, you're gonna be looking at the ground. Well, that's gonna be warmer. It's gonna be a lot of kind of yellow ochre, sort of warmer colors, because you're gonna be picking up a lot of bounce light that's hitting the ground and bouncing up into these planes. You know, we're getting a lot of that in here too. In here, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of these areas as I work my way down. Just going to put those in so we can see what I'm talking about. Don't want to go too far because that it doesn't quite overlap the uh, the other. So now I can go back to my tree we were talking about. So this green isn't that different from the value up here. So it doesn't matter as much. I'm going to just allow my color here to communicate the difference here. I'm, the main thing I liked was that little pop of light right there. And the American flag has a really nice bit of light on it as well. I don't want to overlook because I like that too. I'm going to lean more gray again. So going back to our core, my core gray is ultramarine and burnt sienna. If I'm going for darker, then I go ultramarine and burnt umber. Going too far there. But I'm gonna work my way down here now. And I'm just gonna to try to avoid my little shapes. And I'm just, I'm trying to remove myself from what it is I'm looking at. So I don't wanna really be aware that that's a flag or be aware that this is these are awnings and this is a building. I want to really just allow the shape to sort of sculpt the idea. I'm going to go warm in these windows because people tend to go blue in windows because you think, I think impulsively you think, well, light is, this light from the sky is going to reflect in the windows. But more often than not, light will actually enter the window and create a dark warm area. So I'm gonna pitch that area dark and warm. Come back and get some cool 
for this area over here. Try and use a little less water if I can be cautious because I want this area to sort of fall proceed back here goes under there. I'm just looking for these shapes here. I've got this triangle now I'm looking at. I'm gonna go back to yellow ochre. We're all seeing it. I've got this little kind of L, upside down L. A lot of these uh, really beautiful, something I've noticed about Pittsburgh, a lot of the kind of earth tone bricks everywhere. So we've got little bits of information here. Don't want to get too carried away. Any amount of detail I start doing down here is going to start taking away from where I want to really draw the focus to, which is up here. I'm going to take this, uh, so this warm, carry that in. And I want to come back up. And again, I'm going to start here with the cobalt fill the area a little bit before I switch to my gray. And then that, that green, because I want to get a little bit of a green kind of, I like that sort of greenish tint. And even if this is still a little bit wet, try to get some of that to melt into that. I'm going to switch back to raw sienna and try to pick up this shape here. And I can come back in and detail some of these arches of things later. Get our cast shadow there. And then this goes all the way down. I want to go pretty strong, kind of raw sienna. Because I really want to push the glow of this archway. Now I can come in too with some of these warms and get some of the detail in the architecture here where it's still fairly warm before we come in and do our last uh, pass with the darkest value. I'm gonna get some warm in this pocket here because light bouncing around in there. There's a little roof there, and then we start sort of losing the information down here. It becomes less important. And then our tree here. We have some really bright greens. But again, I'm trying to focus on the value here. Get rid of our I'm gonna kind of turn this on its side here. too far. And I do everything I can to get texture in a sketch. So I'll, I will use the side of the brush. If I'm out painting in the field and I see a stick that's interesting, I would use a, just pick up anything you can find to make interesting kind of texture. Um, I'm focusing on the shape though here. I don't want to get too carried away, but I've got trying to get this lighter value. 
a nice strong saturated value because now this is starting to dry back there or it has dried uh, much lighter and because it's dried lighter the saturation of the paper uh, or the white of the paper has decreased the saturation so some of these areas i want to get this is that area i really liked where it's kind of poking through my porch here it helps reinforce that porch and bring these darks in to our tree. And I've got burnt umber ultramarine trying to get the dark of that tree coming down. And I'm always kind of in transition from warm to cool. So I'm always trying to kind of think of everything in sort of subtle transition because of the way light is constantly sort of bouncing around and picking up light from one area and depositing it in other areas the color is constantly kind of transitioning very subtly from warm to cool i just put my hand right in the tree <laughs> it happens so i'm always trying to be a little bit conscious of transitioning subtly from warm to cool so I'm gonna, I dragged in a little bit of cool that sort of muddied that and now I'm gonna pitch this back towards yellow ochre as we get lower because it's gonna start picking up bounce light from the ground, getting on the, the uh, stair. So, and you know, I'm not as concerned about my drawing down here because I, I just want to make sure you get the idea of it. But I don't want, this is not, this is not a sketch about the post office. It could be, and I might think of things differently. But what I want to do is bring you to my experience of, of walking down this street and looking over and seeing that, that big, beautiful church. That's very large and kind of, uh, interesting and so uh, in order to do that i i don't want to take away focus from it so i'm going to allow this area to kind of start to dissolve and fall away a little bit you know, i'm trying to be warm under here and start to try to pick up some of these different changes i don't want to overshoot the house there's a another bush back here and there's some other information here but I'm closing an eye and squinting, and I'm, I'm trying to not pay too much attention to the fact that this is, you know, whether it's a porch or whatever it is that I'm trying to sketch, because I just want to allow the um, information to kind of reveal itself, I guess, in a sense. There's a rail there, another push. And then back here, I'm just closing an eye and squinting and looking for the you know, there's every manner of detail and stuff back here, but I am not interested in really trying to make it important. So I wanna allow this whole area to kind of blend in with itself and just pick up some of those spots. The tree covers up a lot of that stuff. 
when you go back to our warm umber and ultramarine. Get in our window here, here. There and there. Get a little bit cooler here and then we'll come in. And I accidentally like pick up pieces and drop it other places all the time accidentally. So my usually my sketchbooks are a huge mess because um, if you can tell, I'm not very precious about the process per se. I wanna to try to make sure I'm getting this in perspective. You know, I'm loose in a sense, and I allow some things to just fall as they lay, but I, I am still fairly cautious about perspective because I don't want my, I don't want it to lose the sense of reality. So perspective is still gonna be pretty important to me. You know, I'll wing it on some parts, but when it comes down to it, I wanna make sure I'm hitting some of those points in perspective because I don't want to lose um, the sense of, of place. In perspective, as I'm sure you guys know, this is probably really redundant, but um, perspective is probably one of the, the easiest way to live. It, it, it will flatten you out real fast. If your perspective is off, you can get, uh, you lose a lot of your, uh, believability very quickly to, if your perspective falls off. So I'm gonna get this uh, I'm gonna actually go blue and pick up the set. So we've got our cobalt going fairly strong blue here. I'm gonna get this out of this mailbox. It's not terribly crucial but You never know. You never know what's going to mean something to people. That's something I've really come to enjoy with doing little sketches. And then I have, um, you know, an Instagram and a website and I'll get, do these little location sketches around town or, you know, back in Virginia where I came from. And, um, and I'll get contacted by people and I'll just sketch some br random bridge in a park. And, you know, I like, oh, you know, I like the way the sunset is, Kind of falling on this part of the of the uh, bridge or whatever, and then I'll get some random person will email me and say, "Oh, that's where my you know spouse proposed to me or whatever kind of thing." It's really fun to connect with people through those those little moments in their life and and how uh, you know places can mean so much. And again, a lot of this area back here gets lost. So I'm gonna get some of that green, but the main thing I'm trying to do here is close an eye and squint, find some of the, get, pick up some of that texture and value here. But also I'm, I'm at this point, I just wanna, I really wanna reinforce this perspective so that you are moving back into space as you're looking at it. I'm gonna go strong, raw sienna here and try to pick up some of these steps where light is bouncing up onto that. And I might do my rail in a minute. If I do it right now, I'll probably lose it. But I'm gonna get this sort of, this sort of uh, mucky gray here. And I just wanna really kind of reinforce this perspective here to make sure you're getting the sense. A little bit of blue here. knock back some of the edge here, you know, and then also really just want to um, reinforce my perspective here. So you get the sense, you know, use the side of the brush. I use my hand a little bit. I like to use my hands or my clothes a lot of times, especially on location. I usually end up covered in paint because I use my shirt or whatever else and I'm not terribly I sort of <laughs> whatever it takes to make a image. I don't really care. But I do want to make sure I'm getting this perspective here. That sense of uh, going back into 
space in our eye line here. We're gonna get a nice dark here. People tend to be more silhouetted than you would think when you're looking at, I'm gonna bring these women a little bit closer and just suggest the silhouette of people, some people walking. Throw them, get them a little cash out. Oop, ah, got a little chunky there. Give them a little bit of a cast shadow. And that just gives a scale. It takes extremely little information when we're talking about cars or people. It takes very little information to communicate a person or a car. It's all about context. It's all about setting the stage and then going for the simple shapes. You know, usually you just see the basic shape of a car, like the top plane, the front, maybe the windshield of a car. So it's not something you want to get too caught up in noodling away at detail because as you're painting, and again, this bit might be redundant for many of you, but as you're painting, you know, we spend our whole childhood developing uh, a sort of safety blanket of a language of symbols so that our life becomes, we take the complexity, the intensity of reality and we can condense it down into these shapes, right? And that's how we, that's how it's not so overwhelming and that's how we communicate. You know, that's of course the key to communicating right? You know, the, you know which bathroom you need to go in, or you know where to stop your car, because we build our life on these symbols, right? So when we're painting, we're trying to, our flag is bleeding into the gutter. And I kind of like that, how the red is sort of, uh, but, you know, we spend our whole life building this system of symbols. And then when you paint, we're trying to actively go into our brain and rewire those things because your brain thinks a car looks like a symbol of a car, right? And we tend to think people look like a, the symbol of a person. And we tend to think, you know, and that's part of why people struggle with portraiture is like our brain thinks an eye looks like this because this is what you draw when you're a child. And so what happens is it's in the milliseconds between you looking at the thing and then the paper your brain goes hold on I got it from here I know what an eye looks like and you're like what happened to my portrait it looks so weird uh it's because your brain is overriding your intuition and so what we have to do as painters is actively work against that grain and um and decondense and and sort of re-simplify re-figure out a way to communicate the complexity of life by focusing on things like shapes and um, and how you actually experience and see things rather than what your brain thinks it's seeing because um, it'll trick you into uh, thinking it knows what's what it's doing. You so ever we're going to go seen multiple times. Sorry, what? Do you ever do the scene multiple times? Like if you really like this building, will you do different versions of it or do, uh, do I, it once? I, I have on request on my YouTube channel, I've had people say, hey, can you do, they'll usually it's because they want to see it in a different medium. I do a lot of uh, gouache painting on my YouTube channel because I just, I get a ton of questions about gouache, um, which is funny because it doesn't seem to translate locally. I don't have a lot of local painters asking about gouache but online there's sort of a movement towards gouache um but uh i i would do the same scene um if if i liked a different lighting if i really liked a scene and i was curious about like a different lighting i might come back in the morning and see what it looks like at morning um that's something i've done before uh, but usually not. Usually it, it, you, there's just too much to sketch. <laughs> there's too much to sketch and, you know, life with two kids, a five-year-old and a three-year-old is too crazy <laughs> to get back anywhere hardly. So um, I've ended up sketching a lot of the same thing because I've done a lot of uh, demos around different specific parts of town where, it was, where I didn't have a whole lot of options. <laughs> but um, 
usually if I do, I try to at least at the very least pick a different thing that I'm interested in highlighting or, or show, drawing interest to, uh, or pick a different time. So maybe go at noon instead of morning or go in the evening and try it in the evening instead of uh, early morning, maybe, you know, pick up a little bit of this and we're, we're almost, we're going to try to land this thing. Um, I feel, I feel like with watercolor, like a lot of it, I, I liken in the classes I teach, I liken watercolor to uh, getting an airplane up off the ground. And the drawing phase is a lot like trying to get into the air, just getting into the air. And then the actual painting part, unfortunately for watercolor, it kind of requires a level of allowing yourself to just sort of push the tip the nose and go into a free fall. And so a lot of times you have to learn to let go and allow a lot of these things to just sort of work themselves out. Um, and then it's all a matter of how you deal with what mistakes you've made <laughs> really and, and, uh, and bringing it back. Then it has to do with being a laser accurate sort of sketch person. So I'm gonna get some of these. I like uh, I like the long cast shadows that kind of uh, help communicate that perspective, right? Because they're gonna get get kind of fatter and longer as they get closer. Communicate this. Jared, Love. one of the uh, members was saying they'd like to see what you're you're doing with the paint. Um, Helena, do you mean his palette? You'd like to see. Let's try this. Maybe slide everything to the left. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, we don't need to see that. I guess the value study is pretty much done. Plus, I drew all over it. Oh, great. Thank you. There we go. Jared, I wanted to kind of, um, although I don't see that problem with anybody who's logged in here, but a little trick on the perspective that uh, I learned from my watercolor expert professor back in college when you're looking at the perspective and you're at a location uh -huh. look at where the bricks come straight across and that is your eye level or here yeah. everybody already kind of knows how you know you you explained how the angle will keep going up the sharper the angle the right. further away you are from the vanishing point right. so where you see these bricks come across this corner straight they're going to go up at one point and they're going to go down at the other point where they come straight across on the corner of the building that's your eye level and that's just that's true. a quick little trick for quick sketching i don't know if that made it any easier for anybody but i do want to ask that's a great. question now for this Absolutely. for this sketch that you're working on okay yes, uh this is still this is still a study or will you take this and finish this as a regular painting or will you translate it onto another sheet and make it a finished painting? So I just tend to collect these occasionally sell these on the internet. Um, just a word about what I'm doing, although this also might be redundant. I'm doing, um, I've got these large blue areas, right? With this shadow. So I'm coming back in with some, cadmium orange and just popping in some of the complementary color to the main right. area just to break up this information and um, to get the, but I'm going to try to keep the value the same down there. Um, so in terms of, of yes, I, I do, um, I will come back and sometimes if I really like a scene, I will come back and, and, and do it larger. I've done, uh, you know, 18 by 24 versions of some, some sketches uh, that I really liked. But for the most part, I just kind of collect these as they are, um, you know, and move on to the next one. I don't, uh, you know, cause I end up, I spend a lot of my time working on illustration. And so I kind of, I like the, I like the freedom of being able to do sketches and, and not have to worry about it having a, a specific home or uh you know goal it's like a, a sandbox that i can play in and i don't have to worry about 
worry about it specifically selling or anything. Um, right. Another... But if you wanted a finished piece, this is still the study, correct? And then you would go on to another oh, piece yeah. of paper. Okay. Yeah, if I wanted to do something more finished, I would then take the, yes. So yes, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I would take this information and then um, and convert it into a, a, a larger painting. Yeah, I'm gonna move that over here for a second. Another tip I, I picked up from a, a painter is to do the power lines upside down because your arm arcs better this way. Okay, thank you. Thank you for asking. So I'm gonna just put in a couple power lines. I like power lines because they they kind of, they tell you, well, first they give you sort of a three dimensional sense of space. They also kind of uh, imply, you know, activity, human activity, that there's people here that live in this scene. And I also like that they, I like anything that comes in from off page because like cast shadows, because they, um, imply that the picture is bigger than the than the image that you've sketched so it sort of implies that there's more to this than just what you're seeing on the uh let me bring this back over a little bit and put in the last couple touch or two and then we're good i'm gonna get there's another kind of tree right here that comes in and reduce some of this information so i can use clean water to sort of knock back some of these edges that I feel like are too hard or competing with the the area of interest. And then when I'm about 80% done, if I've taped it, which I usually do, I'll take the tape off so that I can get a more clear idea of what it's gonna look like when it's done. And then the last thing I will do is you can use, um, you could use a tube of gouache. There we go. Or sometimes I'll use white pencil like this. And, uh, you know, white pencil works just as well. If you're using a wa like a waxy pencil, you can get just as good of a uh, kind of response to it. And I will just a little power line there, or I'll use white gouache um, directly from the tube. Get a little water and where are we at? Okay, good. Make sure I'm with you still. And just pick up some of the white, some of the things that stand out to me is brighter that I might've overlooked. You know, I kind of carried this roof down too far so I can adjust that. Um, of course, you know, some people are opposed to using gouache. Um, to me, I, I feel like I, I went to a watercolor exhibit of uh, Winslow Homer and John Singer Sargent and um, Eakins, and they used a ton of gouache and pastel and every manner of junk on top of their watercolors. So in my opinion, if it's good enough for the, for the kings, then it's, it's good enough for using. but I can just bring back some of the whites here and there, but I don't want to get too carried away in that area. There, there, maybe the tops of these people, just so that they're not lost. There's a for sale sign here, but that, I don't know, that doesn't really, I like that there, there's a rail here that kind of helps with that space there. There's a little flat plane there. And there is a top plane that I've mostly got, at least enough, I feel like, that I don't think I need to really bring any of that stuff back. I don't, again, I don't want to get too carried away and distract from uh, the top up here, where I feel like I really wanted to bring focus and draw attention to.
and there's a couple little architectural details that are really pretty that I don't want to miss. And then that, and that's pretty much as much as I will do. If I have more time, I might go in and if I really like this sort of architecture here, I might bring in some worms, kind of reinforce some of that or draw some of that in. But that's about the extent of what I usually will take a sketch to. Uh, I really look here. wonderful. Oh, thank you. And uh, and then and that's pretty much it. I'm always a fan when you can find a cast shadow. If this cast shadow is not there, I will typically, literally, just make it up and put it in, because it's a really good way to help push the viewer towards the the object of interest. Um, where are we at here? But um, I feel like if I close an eye and squint, I've got the values, the major shapes of value as close as I'd like them to be. I think, um, you know, you can, you can, from here, you could take it to as realistic as you want it to. You could just keep going um, and adding more and more detail to it. But um, this is about as far as I typically will take a sketch in a sketchbook. It gives me all the information I need. It gives me the color notes that I want particularly things like this. Um, let me drop it down, come here. But this, um, that I noticed in real life that you lose in the photograph, in the photograph it tends to get very sort of brown, but I like having this sort of cool atmosphere. It really gives a sense of that fill light from the sky, um, picking up on those cool notes. And, and then, yeah, so I can take the information here and I could go on and do another sketch or just bring the information that I've sort of explored and discovered and, and carry that over into, you know, in my case, uh, background work for animation or um, comics work or kids books work or whatever. So that I can just add a level of, um, of realism to an otherwise kind of abstract world that I'm working in. That's a beautiful job. I mean, it was just so wonderful to watch you uh, as you Thank were going you. along. Um, I have one question. I've recently um, uh, started with the gouache. Oh, nice. Beginner, and I was wondering what your uh, number one tip would be uh, for gouache, a beginner. I guess my number one tip going into it is that do not be fooled by the fact that it's technically watercolor. So gouache is, um, do I have a, I had my, um, yeah, so here's a recent one I did. Um, so gouache, I will say, so gouache is extremely finicky, right? And, um, I would say avoid cold pressed paper. It's going to be a huge pain in the neck dealing with the texture. Um, I like to use hot pressed paper or ideally my all time favorite. I just ran out of the little cards of it is a Crescent 101 board, which is an illustration board. And oh. it's, um, it's a smooth surface. But so this is one that I did in my, in our garden with the kids. And, um, the key to getting gouache to sit is that you've got to treat it more like oil painting and, and the a la prima school of thought, if that makes sense. So try to be fairly thick and direct with your color because if you start, it's extremely finicky. Like if I took a wet rag and wiped this, I could wipe it almost back to the white of the page. It's extremely finicky and falls apart very easily. Um, so any water that you have in it or on it is going to make it dissolve and fall apart. So in order to get it to lay on and sit on top of itself like this, you've got to use mm -hmm. minimal water. So okay. I think my biggest advice would be go into it, treating it as if it was oil paint with terp or whatever mineral spirits, mm -hmm. not watercolor. <laughs> because if you go into it, trying to layer it, it's going to start dissolving on you and falling apart. And it's very frustrating and it all mm -hmm. turns sort of this color and mm -hmm. um, 
but grainy and weird. And then it dries really chalky and strange. Um, yeah, that, well, that was a problem I was having. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, the key I found, and then I have a friend named Lena Revo, who's a gouache painter, who also has a really good YouTube channel for gouache painting you should check out. Lena Revo. Uh, she's in uh, Portugal. But she, um, she and I both have talked about this extensively, and the real key or the learning curve is figuring out how to treat gouache like oil paint, basically, which is just come at it as thick and direct as you can. So just remember, when you even when you go clean your brush, keep in mind, if you go right into your pool of color, it's gonna be dissolved. So you've gotta dry it off on something, get rid of that water and try to be as direct as you can with the color, um, even when it feels very thick. If it's not thick, it's gonna start dissolving and it's also gonna dry a different color, which is another kind of <laughs> learning curve you've gotta get past with gouache, which is that uh, in, in the same way, watercolor does a similar thing where it dries a little bit lighter, so technically a slightly different. Gouache will just dry a different color because of the same principle. It's just the way light affects it when it's wet versus when it's dry. So um, the more okay. direct you can be from the palette to the page, the more mm -hmm. direct the color will, will look. I tend to try to think of gouache sculpturally. I do mm -hmm. with watercolor too, but a little bit maybe more, I think more holistically, as you could see, I worked all the way down. With gouache, I tend to think sculpturally, which is more, I think, uh, uh, probably an oil uh, in the school of alla prima, so to speak, which mm -hmm. is to say, I will shoot for this color. I use a fat brush, a one inch flat brush, mm. and I will shoot for, this was recorded for YouTube, by the way. So, I mean, you could watch me do this if you want to <laughs> watch it later, uh, but I will shoot for say this color, right? So some kind of orange on the tomato, and then I'll, go for this chunk of what the square is like maybe one inch by half inch and then i'll move to this area and i go okay so am i moving away from the light source or closer to the light source is the temperature getting warmer cooler you know tip this way it's going cooler it's moving into shadow it's getting a little bit darker still very saturated because you've got subsurface scatter where light's entering the flesh of the tomato you know uh, uh, but so essentially so i'm going to go saturated slightly darker right so then i mix up that direct red and just chunk in that area. And then I just keep doing that all okay. over. And I think more sculpturally and less holistically. And the holistic part sort of figures itself out. Once you have the drawing down, <laughs> the rest of it will sort of figure itself out as you sculpt the objects. That's how I treat oil paint as well. But if you go in and you go, I'm gonna wash all of this bluish green and then wash this, this, and then avoid this and come back with this, it's gonna all, it's gonna all turn into that. So you have to be very direct with gouache to uh, a point that's pretty frustrating. But, you know, gouache is not really meant for necessarily for like large finished um, pieces. You know, it was I, ideally the its best case scenario was essentially its, its history is that it was used for sketching for larger oil paintings in Italy. That's where it came from, guazzare. And then it, uh, which means to sketch. Uh, and then later on it was, I ideally used for painters in the in the 50s who were illustrators and the whole goal was like I got a deadline for New York whatever magazine I have to do some lady doing something and then erase it and do another sketch like for the next magazine the next day so you can you could just keep going with it and it was fine and then of course acrylic came and it was one-tenth the cost and not as finicky blah 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 you could just toss it and move on or sell it and move on it is much more permanent than gouache. Gouache is not particularly light fast. You can buy very high grade paints, but it's, it's not really specifically made to be this like finished thing. So I would say that's the other thing is I would say treat it, treat it thickly and also try to be, try to bring a, an element of carefreeness in the same way you would with watercolor and that you don't, don't, uh, I wouldn't worry about galleries or you know <laughs> or whatever i would just try to enjoy the ride uh, with gouache because um if you don't it's extremely frustrating okay thank you very much and again you did a wonderful job thank you <laughs> thanks this was really fun i hope to get to meet you guys in person <laughs> someday that would be really nice you would love that as well thank you so much for uh working through the technology with us and and doing this wonderful demo yeah, this worked out great. Um, I enjoyed it. Thank you.
Um, well, anybody I guess... else have any questions for Jared? My only question is, I, I missed it at the beginning. I don't know if it, or if it's in the PDF, but where exactly is this church? Bellevue, sorry. Um, so I live pretty close to Bellevue. This is, if you're walking through like downtown, so to speak, or Link, is it Lincoln Avenue? Um, there's like a bunch of, there's like a, uh, I think like a brewery and a, and a bakery and a Chinese restaurant and a bunch of other stuff. It's on, it's in the downtown-ish, you know, town area. That's something I, I have that, to say. Uh, Lance had posted uh, in the group chat that he'll never walk past, uh, walk past it again without thinking of this demo. Oh, cool. Nice. It's a, <laughs> I love that. I love that area. Um, I live just on the other side, 279 from it. So, um, like I'm technically in our yard is in Ross Township, but our, we're sort of right on the, the tri border of Westview, Bellevue <laughs> and Ross Township. But, um, but anyways, I go down there often and I love that, that sort of down. I love that about Pittsburgh in general, which we didn't really have as much in Virginia where I can and I lived in Richmond and I like how every little neighborhood has its own little kind of pocket. That's kind of neat. Everybody seems very, you know, like everybody has their pocket here, <laughs> which is not how Richmond wasn't quite like that. I don't know. We didn't have like a little cute downtown like you do with Carnegie and I'm probably saying it wrong. I say everything wrong. I thought it was Duke. I've, I've just recently found it. It's not Duquesne. <laughs> I've been saying everything wrong. <laughs> yeah, uh, anyways, uh, I love that. That's okay. Pittsburgh. We like forgive all these you. Little, yeah. Carnegie in New York. Oh, oh, okay. See, I had to learn how to say Carnegie when I moved here. So you nice. just adjust. I'm, I'm, I'm adjusting. Richmond's the same way. It's full of, of names that only Richmond people know how to say. Mm -hmm. And no one knows what they're saying when they first moved there. But thank you all for having me. This was really fun. That was wonderful. It was Jared. great thank to you. watch. Really, really interesting. Beautiful work. Thank you. And I have, uh, you know, a YouTube channel with tons of other demos. If you're curious about gouache or watercolor. I'll definitely oil. check that out. Yeah. Um, and where and is your book all... available, Jared? Sorry? Where is your book available? Oh, the book is uh, available everywhere. Uh, as I understand it, they've sold out at, at Barnes and Noble and some other places. But you can get it on Amazon. And then local shops, like comic shops and places, probably still have it where people just aren't really going anymore. But um, mm -hmm. Amazon would be the easiest, <laughs> I think. That's fantastic. Good luck with it. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much. Yeah, thanks, Jared. That was amazing. I've already subscribed to your YouTube channel, so I'll be watching. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, did, I saw someone ask the title of the book. It's Cody is the title of the book, if you're curious. It's a kid's book. Um, you know, young adult kids book. But uh, that's it. If you Googled my name, I'm sure it would come up. Jared, we caught some of this on uh, on video. Is it all right if we would post it on our website? Sure, yeah, absolutely. You. you can definitely do whatever you need with it. Wonderful, thanks. And then I guess we will also need to make sure we get your address uh, to address.